welcome to a brand new episode of Writer's Routine. This week we're chatting to Alex Hay, a historical fiction author. His new novel is The Housekeepers. We talk about how he shifts gears through a working day, switching between writing and the day job. Also, the battle, the battle he has every day over his workspace and the comfy chair. And you can hear why he's moving away from being a thorough spreadsheet type plotter. You do just let the plan sit there as a framework to support you to make sure you're hitting those key beats and that there's a sort of coherence to the overarching narrative. But but you give yourself permission to, to, to flee when you need to. And so I already had that in mind. And actually then when writing in this slightly more organic way, I probably absorbed by osmosis certain rules about how scenes go about act structure on a sort of micro level and therefore inevitably i was writing bit by bit and making certain choices about okay do i feel as the reader of this scene for the first time there's enough tension here do i know enough about what's going on have i given myself as the reader enough context about why someone is doing what they're doing. And so I think I was probably making some of the same choices that I would when planning out a book, scene by scene, but I was just doing it straight onto the page rather than, you know, an Excel sheet first. It's all on the way in this week's Writer's Routine. Welcome along. My name is Dan Simpson. Thank you for being there. This is Writer's Routine, where we take a look through an author's working day. The idea is dead simple. We see how they get stuff done. We try and mine some of the secrets that they've learnt through their time, getting books onto shelves, and see if we can use it in our own day. Uh, This week, we are with Alex Hay. Alex has worked in magazines, in the charity sector, and is now an author. His new novel is The Housekeepers. It won the Caledonia Novel Award in 2022. It's all about Mrs King, who is a housekeeper, born into a world of con artists and thieves. She's made herself quite respectable from where she's come from and runs the grandest home in Mayfair. The house is packed with treasures... But then Mrs. King is suddenly dismissed from her position, so recruits an eclectic group of women to join her in revenge. The plan is to rob the house of everything in it, right under the nose of everyone who lives there. It's a lot of fun. We chat about how he manages sharing the same working space every day with his partner and the battle over the armchair and the cosy corner. Also, you know, if you listen to music on Spotify... Uh, at the end of the year, you'll get your roundup. Here we almost listen to tracks and artists, that kind of thing. You can hear why for Alex, it is almost solely rain music. We get into it with fonts as well, which is always one of my favourite parts of a chat. And we get a little bit psychological, actually, about how helpful a pretty font can be. And, and maybe not as helpful as you might think. Also, this was recorded a few weeks ago now on Alex's proper publication day. So it's full of that joyful goodness that finally the book is out there. So let's get a lot of that and we kick things off with Alex, as we always do, with what he sees around him in the place where he sits down to write. So I live in South East London um, and I am not sitting in the room where I'm usually writing at the moment because the primary school next door is doing either their sports day or their summer show or both at the same time. So there's a megaphone and very excited children screaming. So actually, I'm going to have to close my eyes and imagine what I see around me. So we have a box room at the back of the house, which is pretty tiny and, however, is a very good place to go and lock yourself away from the world and get the words down when required. But it also serves as a place to work from home. So I share that space with my husband and in it we have a very small desk and a very large armchair. And the armchair is obviously the preferable place to sit. So turns have to be taken about who gets to have that If I'm in the chair, then in front of me, I have a bookcase with a mix of some of my favourite books, favourite authors, all there is inspiration. On the walls, I've got not too many pictures, or at least not too many that are writing inspired. 
Um, but I do have something very special, which is um, I was lucky enough to win the Caledonia Novel Award competition 2022 and received very lovely framed picture commemorating that moment. So that sits on the wall to remind me that a first little milestone was crossed. Um, you can write, keep going. Um, and then around me, otherwise, I will just have a good mug of coffee slash actually entire pot of coffee, which is um, demolished pretty quickly, particularly in the morning. Um, uh, plenty of water and my laptop. And that is that is about all I have around me. Let's talk about the politics involved with who gets the armchair. Are you both working in the same room at the same time? Yeah, we often are actually. So if if we're if we're both working from home, then yes, we'll both be there. And the politics are very fairly managed. So it would be today is my day, tomorrow is your day. So it's just back and forth. But actually, to be honest, I ought to wean myself off the delicious armchair because my posture in it is absolutely diabolical. So I sometimes listen to this podcast in particular and people have very good very ergonomic setups they are taking care of their spines and they are future proofing themselves against future back disasters whereas i am not at all so maybe the armchair is actually a um a red herring maybe i need to avoid without getting too i guess woo woo about it do, do, do you feel a difference like you want the armchair because it feels comfy i guess it's more luxurious but it, is there a difference in your work output or quality do you think when you're lumped with the desk i would love to say there was and then try and use that as a sort of case for holding on to the cozy corner but no i don't think so i think if i'm writing I'm probably going to do it the same quality in any seat. Um, but location otherwise is important. So actually I've learned over the years that I'm not great at writing in cafes. Um, distraction around me is actually not terribly helpful. And I also really hate being overlooked because particularly when writing a first draft, you just want to be able to scratch stuff out and try stuff over. And the idea that someone could peer over my shoulder and see the horror show that's coming onto the screen makes my uh, makes everything curdle inside. So, actually, just the privacy of being at home, tucked away that's the that's the ideal circumstance. That's interesting when you compare that to how you work w- with your husband, perhaps in in the same room as you writing. By practice, it's quite a, a solitary art. It's you face down with, with your laptop. How does the dynamic of your husband being there uh, affect what you're doing if you don't like to be overlooked or kind of bothered? Well, the first thing I always put on are my noise cancelling headphones. So I have a very, very good playlist of rain music. And when Spotify does its little roundup at the end of the year of what you've listened to the most, uh, it is just the soothing sounds of rain pretty much all, all year long. So that's quite key, actually. That blocks out pretty much everything around me. So, you know, if, for example, he was on a call, I just wouldn't hear it. I could just I could just type through, um, but we'll we'll sort of probably come on to the the routine element of this later. I work full time, so we're sort of talking the margins of the working day here. So actually, at those times of day, it's probably a bit more easy going. Um, if it was sort of full on uh, Teams meetings, Zoom meetings, I think it might be um, I might be a bit more distracted. You mentioned how you've got some books around you. There, 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 there's not too much though. What what have you got in terms of your work around you? Uh, have you got any post-it notes? Is is it all on the laptop? How do you keep things organised to know what you want and what you need for research? Well, I feel very disappointing to say I do not have my post-its. I do not have a very exciting uh, plot flowchart on the wall. I have um, wrestled with whether actually that would be a very good thing to do and keep you focused and very inspired, but it's all on my laptop. So I've got a couple of documents that are sort of floating tabs on my screen. So let's assume I'm in first draft mode, for example. I'll have that document up. I'll probably have a running notes and ideas and questions document next to it. And I will probably have flung in chunks of research notes into that one place so I can just refer to everything really, really quickly and easily. Um, And if I'm working to a plan at that stage in the story, then I will probably also have a tab open with that all set out 
probably on a grid. So between those three tabs, I've probably got most of what I need in a chunk of writing time. Um, and we'll use those and dive between those just to get everything that I'm, I'm after. And like we get into it with softwares and, and fonts and stuff. Just just run us through your preferences, what you like to work with. What, what font are you keen on, Alex? I'm so pleased you asked this question because I could talk about this all day because I have very strong opinions on all of this. And I've evolved on all of this a lot, actually. So at the moment, I so let me take you on the journey. So originally, I did all my writing in pages on my Mac. I still use my Mac, but once I got a deal, I realized pretty quickly I was going to have to switch to Word because Word was the sort of go-to for everybody in publishing. And also it sends to Kindle more easily, just much more straightforward from top to toe. So used Word pretty much all the way through the editing process. However, um, having had many nightmares where my poor old Mac was not really saving or keeping the Word work that I had just completed, I realized that I was going to need to find a new solution. So I'm now pretty much writing everything in Google Docs, which is all the same sort of setup and formatting as Word, but just, just gives me the reassurance that it's saving live as I go. I can then download a Word copy and then email that to myself every day. So that's probably more detail than you needed, but that is literally uh, how I am doing it at the moment. So at the moment, it's all in Google Docs. And then at sort of daily moments, I'll just download everything, save, send, back it up. Um, but it makes me feel I'm now very indebted to Google for that like Google holds everything at the moment. So come on, Google, no giants allowed to fall over. It's uh, yeah, it's quite the journey, I have to say. That, that's that's quite the adventure from beginning to end. Um, yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> uh, what what font opinions do you have as well? Yeah, I do have quite strong font opinions too. So um, I, traditionally, I was um, an old faithful of Times New Roman. Um, then I switched actually writing the first draft of The Housekeepers because I wanted to do, I wanted to use a font that was just a bit more free and would make me feel as though it was rough work and that therefore I could take more risks with it. And there's something about Times New Roman that just feels very set and quite staid and I sort of associate it with work. So I switched to Courier because it had that uh, lovely typewriter look to it. And it also seemed to me to be a bit more filmic and look a bit more like a script. And it just all seemed very romantic. So Courier got me through um, first draft of The Housekeepers very happily. And then later on, again, you're going to be like, this is way too much detail. Later on, I switched to, I think, Georgia and then narrowed the margins so that the page would look more like a printed book. And that was for the sort of line editing stages, just so I could make sure that paragraph lengths and the sort of, I don't know, tone and texture of the sentences sort of looked right and looked bookish. Loved that stage because at that point, everything just looked really beautiful. So therefore, it's actually slightly deceptive because it allows you to get away with um, quite clunky writing because the font is so pretty. So that was my sort of journey. Um, and I would say I'm probably on the same path writing book two, but I did skip to the lovely, lovely Georgia font very early this time because it's just too too compelling. But I might have to be ruthless with myself, take it all back to Times New Roman, tidy up that praise. Yeah, I was I was wondering, um, is it reading too much into it to think if you've got some beautiful setup where you like the look of it so much, how might that affect ruthless editing? Maybe you don't want to cut words because they look so pristine. I fear you may be right. Yeah, I think it could lead me down a very glittery prose path, which is probably not where I want to go. Um, so I, I I might have to relook at this, actually. You prompted me. I might go save it all in Courier and do some good hard chopping of the latest draft and then cycle around again. But I love font. I do think it's quite important, actually, for just tricking your brain into switching gear. And I know a lot of people save to Kindle and read there too, which I do also at sort of later stages. That, I think, is more for pacing, that I think is really useful for working out where you've gone too slow or too fast and just smoothing things out. But it also shows you quite quickly on a Kindle screen where you've just got big chunks that are just not quite right or need need more work before you share the manuscript with anyone else. So yeah, all those tricks that you can use to try and um, 
trick your brain into looking at it afresh are, are, are what you need. So love font. <laughs> we'll talk about the routine in just a tick. But you mentioned that you, because of your day job, you're working around the edges of the day. Uh, is, is there anything you use to let you know that right now is creative writing time, just something that helps you switch between modes of your brain. I, we touched recently on people that might light a candle or do something uh, quite atmospheric like that, just to let your brain know that, right, this is what you're here to do. Do you know what? I would like to light a candle, actually. That would be that would be lovely. I do not do that at all. I think the main battle I have is against procrastination because if I have a sort of block of time, in the morning or in the evening, it's very easy to just open the laptop and start scrolling through whatever site um, is, is is dangling itself before me. So the main trick for me is actually putting on noise cancelling headphones and playing the uh, very reliable soothing sounds of rain playlist. Because at this point, I think that has sort of sent my brain a message having listened to it so many times and started writing with it so many times, it almost just puts my brain in that mode that, okay, I'm now going into the writing zone. And interestingly, when I've used that same playlist, if I need to concentrate at work, for example, it doesn't work for work at all. For work, I need a totally different playlist. And I think it just shows me that it's just a very different mindset and a very different brain. Um, so or a different side of my brain. Um, so that's probably the main trick. And beyond that, just a good gulp of coffee and a look at the time is probably key. But I do use the um, Pomodoro technique a lot to try and just basically force myself to say, I've got this much time to do writing work in and I cannot waste it. So the second that Pomodoro timer clicks on my screen and then silently starts ticking, um, yeah, have to get to it. So those are the tricks. So uh, the Pomodoro technique is it's normally kind of 25 minutes on, five minutes off. Mm -hmm. is, is, that, is that what you're following? Yeah, I do. Although, interestingly, last uh, autumn, I saw um, the author Harriet Tice talking about, I think, using 15 minute increments and short breaks, but sort of stacking up the sessions more to get the words out. And I, I, I also tried that and it worked quite well, actually, because 15 minutes doesn't sound like very long. Um, but when it's coming steadily, you do see this, the, the word count rack up really quite nicely. So yeah, I've done both. And then I also for a while tried to do sort of 40 minutes and longer breaks. Um, but I just sort of found that I was cheating and just ignoring Pomodoro and the bell was ringing and I wasn't anywhere near my laptop. So that, that didn't do it all. There's probably three scenarios not to complicate the answer for you. There's a, there's a work day, say Monday to Friday, um, and let's assume I'm working from home and then there's a weekend. And then I suppose the third option is when I've actually maybe taken some time off work to try and sort of write with a full working day. But let's assume it's sort of a normal Monday. I'm going to have to be um, working from home for the majority of the day. So I will get up. I'm not the earliest getter-upper in the world. I wish I was. I would love to join the 5am Writers Club, um, but I just don't go to bed early enough and I need lots of sleep. So one day, if as the sun goes down, I can actually have the discipline to go to bed on time, maybe I will be a very, very early starter. But at the moment, I'm probably looking for a sort of 90 minute to two hour window in the morning if I can possibly get it. That would feel like a massive win before work. Um, so that means, you know, being up by no later than seven and then cracking on. Um, and if work starts at, say, somewhere between nine and ten, then I've got that sort of window of time to try and really get the words down before I then log on to work from home. On sort of a few days a week, I'm working from the office. So on those days, actually writing in the morning just doesn't happen because I've got to be up and out to get the train and get into town. Um, so that morning piece is quite carefully um, structured now to try and just get to the chair, get to the desk as quickly as possible and get on with it. So the noise cancelling headphones go on, no distractions allowed, crack on. And then the second it's sort of work time, I just have to switch mode and, and, and go there. Similarly, after work then, so maybe at the end of the working day, have dinner and then try from, say, if I'm at home, 
from about eight-ish or so, put in another little stint of time. Um, and if I'm um, working on a first draft, then that's going to be you know right into the story. If I'm editing, then I'm probably picking a chunk on my to-do list of edits and trying to just focus on a bit of that or all of that if I can. And then recently, actually, with the housekeepers coming out, I've been using that evening time to do all the promo activity I can. So writing blogs or Q&As or trying to just um, stay on top of of any social media activity to just talk about the book and and share it that I don't really have the opportunity to during the working day. Um, uh, and then, and then that's it. So just trying to sort of keep that rhythm going on a daily basis. It sometimes feels like it's quite patchy, and that I'm not making huge progress. But I've found that if I can just keep doing these little incremental sessions every day, the word count does stack up, and the book has momentum. And I also have a hold on the book. Um, whereas if I leave it for too long, things start to drift in the story, and then it's much much harder to get back in. Without getting too much into your day job are the the, the two things you're doing every day writing and working are they quite stark does it take quite a shift of gears and and if it does how might that uh, how does that affect uh, kind of both aspects of your uh, working life um it does take quite a shift of gears so i but i quite like that actually um and it it means that i can just demarcate the two quite tidily. So if I'm working from home, chances are I'm going to be jumping onto a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting, internal or external at, let's say, 10. So I'm going to need to sort of wrap up writing me before that, log on, go into work mode. And, you know, once you're in your inbox at work... (laughs) It, it, you're, you're, you're there, right? You, you can see all the, the, the dramas and excitement that you've got to tackle that day. So um, I find actually at this point, I'm so used to it that the switch, is, the switch is quite straightforward. My job doesn't really call on my writing skills or personality at all. It's really very different. And, you know, I think it, I think it would be interesting if, for example, I had a, had a role that was very, very writing focused. I mean, you know, if I was a copywriter, for example, um, I wonder if I would have to sort of think more thoughtfully about what's my writing voice in fiction versus my sort of writing voice in in marketing, for example. And I wonder if that would be a sort of more nuanced piece of thought for me. Whereas for me, I think I'm quite lucky that work feels very, very different. I just do the switch. I'm there and I'm very much present and at work when I'm at work. And then similarly, can try and just put the guillotine on it on the other side of the day too. So I think it works for me. What about the other way around though? Uh, w- w- we talk so often about uh, like life experience. So quite a lot of authors come to writing quite late and their books are perhaps completely different from they would have been if they had started writing when they were 20, it's just because they've done so much. Uh, how does how do you think your your work life and, and things that you have done in work kind of affects the novels that you're writing. This may be reaching, but uh, d- does it work that way? I don't think that's reaching at all, actually. Um, well, the book I, you know, this book, The Housekeepers, is a story of people who at times feel that urge to right the wrongs they see around them, to make sure that their ambitions are realised and to get their just desserts in life. And who hasn't had a working day at some point in their career where they feel a little bit squashed or a little bit jaded? Um, and I, I hasten to add, in case my current employees are listening, I certainly don't feel that way now. But I can imagine, you know, drawing on the pressure and frustration that sometimes comes from work um, and, and and putting that into the book. Um, and I suppose, you know, life more broadly, you're always drawing on everything. And I, I it sounds quite... Um, we're weird to say it, but you don't you don't know really, do you, what you're drawing on f- from your subconscious and what ingredients are going into the pot to get you there. So I can only imagine that work and life and the exciting sounds outside the window and everything around me is probably all grist to the mill in one way or another, um, and at some point might turn up on the page um, further down the line. When the contract came, and now you're writing your second book, and the first, I mean, so far, I mean, it's only just come out, but there has been success there. 
Uh, how did you go about focusing that time of writing that you had? If you knew that you only had like an hour or a couple of hours before and then after work, uh, what was the process of making sure they were very productive, that you knew what you wanted to get done? How much thought did you give to that aspect of making it more serious as things got serious around you? Yeah, that's a great question. And here's where I throw my answers to you completely out the window, because to be very candid about it, when I first got the deal, I took a little bit of time off work to work on the edits full time. Um, So I actually left my old role um, and felt as though I had this, this moment where I could just take a break and live the dream for just a little bit and work full time to try and get those edits done as well as I possibly could and then get a start on book two. Um, so that was a few months and then I went back to work. So I got a new job started in a um, with a new employer, totally different um, organization um, and then had to finish the first draft of book two um, in the way that in the way that you're just describing, which is both um, writing and working at the same time. And to answer your question about how did I sort of take things seriously when things got serious, um, I was not under huge pressure in that I had a one book deal for the housekeepers. So it was all on me to try and do my very best to put a great book two together, and then hope and pray. Um, that we would be able to sell it. So on that basis, the 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 seriousness was coming from me. It was all self-motivated. And it actually wasn't that different from trying to get an agent or trying to get a deal in the first place. It was sort of resetting that cycle um, and saying to myself, right, let's go again. So I I think the key thing was just sort of recognizing that I had this big opportunity, um, had an agent now, and I would be having a book coming out. And I'd always heard that the very best thing you can do is have book two pretty much ready to go by the time the first one is done. So I actually put, I mean, oceans of pressure on myself to try and get that moving and, and get the book um, ticking forwards. I was lucky in that I had a little head start because I had a little time off where I could really get um, a nice little chunk of the first draft done. And then once I started my new job, I had a bit of a break from writing to sort of resettle myself into that. And then in the spring, started getting back to that mornings, evenings, weekend routine to try and finish off the first draft and and do a couple of my own edits um, on it before sharing it with my agent as well. So I guess the, the nutshell answer to your question is, I just tried to, I just did try to take it seriously and try and treat it almost like a second job that would um, only succeed if I push myself through it. And, you know, the, the beauty sometimes of working in an organizational environment is there's lots of other competing motivations to keep you going. You've got your team to support. You've got your colleagues who are expecting things from you. You've got clients who are commissioning you to do a piece of work. And so therefore you've got all that external pressure. Whereas for me, this is self-generated. This is, you know, my dreams so and no one's going to write the book but me so it's all about sort of just keeping myself ticking forward it seems to go from zero to almost 100 miles an hour in what you need to think about in the you know you're you're kind of writing a, a a novel writing a manuscript because of an idea that you've got and then that gets signed to a book deal and then you're already thinking about what's coming out before that next before the first one's even published. So you're in a headspace where you've got a really perfectly refined book one whilst putting heaps of pressure on yourself to make book two the best it can be because you want that to get picked up too. There's a lot going on. How did you find dealing with that like tornado of thoughts? My God, it is quite a tornado actually. Um, and, I, and I think I tried to skim over um, investigating it too deeply at the time. Otherwise, I think my head would have exploded. But um, now that you ask me, I think I think actually, truthfully, it is quite a lot of pressure because you feel as though you've got this wonderful opportunity and you don't want it to slip away. And you also recognise that publishing is really competitive and getting published is really hard. But I think I heard an author say once, staying published is even harder And so it was not lost on me from the get-go that I really wanted to try and just make sure that I I I would crack on and 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 get book two going. But I also knew, having gone through this cycle before, 
that inevitably the first draft was going to be messy. And I really, really gave myself permission for it to just be an absolute bonfire and be pretty diabolical and sort of just have faith that in the end, I would be able to shape it into a really um, structured and coherent story, but that no one ever gets it done on, on the first go. I mean, some days that is easier to tell yourself than others, for sure. And you look at the sort of horror that's going down on the screen and you think oh my god I, I actually cannot do this I don't know how to do this why has anyone ever yeah. told me I could yeah. but I think that's when you know you just try and get your mindset into gear pull yourself together and just recognize that you can fix it all later you'll change the font you'll relook at it with fresh eyes and it will all be fine so I think there was um a lot of just self-motivation um and just telling myself to pull myself together and get on with it at the start of every day, when you've got the, these two kind of brief windows, how, how did you know what you wanted to get done? <clears throat> Excuse me. Was there a, is, is there a word count? Is there a, an aim of the story? Have you kind of set up that day's scene? So writing The Housekeepers, I had a very detailed scene plan. And that really helped me in the first draft because I knew exactly what was coming next. And actually, it was a scene plan that was so detailed, I started effectively storyboarding out the dialogue, the different points of conflict within it. Um, and so effectively, the write, writing of the first draft was just writing that up. Book two has been totally different in that my plan started to fall apart quite quickly. And in the end, I threw it out the window and went from being an absolute planner to a complete pantser, which was another sort of terrifying evolution in the process. And that meant that actually, when I started writing in the morning, I often really did not know what was coming next at all and would be creeping line by line, turn by turn through the story. And so on that basis, my goal for myself was not word count. It was just time. It was making sure I was putting the time in to just inch the story forward every day. And actually on some days it would go quite fast because if I felt as though I'd hit on a really nice, neat twist or turn in that scene, then the words would really flow. At other moments though, I could just feel myself having backed myself into a complete plot corner and unpicking that and finding a way to turn around and start again was really hard because I would realise that actually that morning's work was just going to be deleting loads of stuff and rewinding myself back several scenes or several chapters um, and going again. And that's painful because then you're just losing work that you you put time into. But I think at this point, I recognise that I write loads more words than ever actually will make it onto a finished published page. And it's all okay. Just the key thing is just to keep the whole engine motoring forward. Completely different practices then. Even the first book, you pretty much know what you're going to get down. And then we've already discussed the pressure that you're putting yourself on yourself for your second book. And that's not entirely going to plan. So you've got to approach it for a from a completely different way. How did you keep yourself going uh, every day when you're not simply writing down what you've planned quite thoroughly but having to lightly put one foot in front of the other and, and hoping that you might find solid ground there i think in the end i found that it wasn't as different as i might have thought it would be because although with book one i was following my plan very closely i would deviate on a sort of line by line scene by scene level all the time um, and I've heard other authors talk about this, that you do just let the plan sit there as a framework to support you to make sure you're hitting those key beats and that there's a sort of coherence to the overall arching narrative. But but you give yourself permission to, to, to flee when you need to. And so I already had that in mind. And actually then when writing in this slightly more organic way, I probably absorbed by osmosis certain rules about how scenes go about act structure on a sort of micro level and therefore inevitably I was writing bit by bit and making certain choices about okay do I feel as the reader of this scene for the first time there's enough tension here do I know enough about what's going on have I given myself as the reader enough context about why someone is doing what they're doing and so I think I was probably making some of the same choices that I would when planning out a book scene by scene, but I was just doing it straight onto the page rather than, you know, an Excel sheet first. So I, I, I don't know, it felt, it felt a bit scary and different, but actually I wonder if in the end, 
you're doing the same thing. It's just that the tools you're using and the method you're using or the speed with which you're putting it down on paper shift slightly. But, but there's a lot of similarity between the planning creative thinking stages and the first draft creative thinking stages. We're back with more from Alex in just a sec. Now, if you're enjoying the show, I'd love to push you towards uh, our Patreon page. I posted on there the other day, just like a little bit of an apology, I think. I know that I bang on about Patreon like a little bit. It's been a manic time at the moment, so I've probably not uh, dedicated as much energy uh, to the Patreon as, as I should have done. Um, it's just been a, it's been more than enough to try and get these out there as frequently as I can. Uh, but, you know, it's simmering down now, so it's f- all systems go, and even more than it's been before, over on our Patreon page with blogs, with posts, with ideas that we share around the community. There is bonus content, there is even a way for your book to sponsor this show, and you get merch on there too. If you have learned anything along the way on this podcast that has helped the way that you tell your stories, you can always support us for bringing you this show. Uh, Help it keep happening over on our Patreon. It doesn't require a lot to become a backer. Just a few dollars a month really, really helps us out at patreon.com forward slash writers routine. Let's get back into it then with Alex Hay chatting through his new novel, The Housekeepers, about Mrs. King, a recently dismissed housekeeper in a grand old Mayfair home who is seeking revenge in the only way she knows how, by nicking stuff. We discuss the very first sentence of the book. I like doing that sometimes. You see, Alex is very keen and analytical. And the first sentence in this is simple, but gets a lot across. So how much did he think about that? Also, you can hear more about the novel. And, well, we've heard that Alex thinks a lot about how he works and the routines and where he listens to this show so with the debut novel now written how much is he still thinking about his routine and whether that might change someone once said to me at work alex you are very faddy meaning whatever shiny new process is dangled before your eyes you will give it a go and it's it's true i really do like trying and testing different ways of working. And that's definitely true in writing as well. I mean, if we'd had this conversation a year and a half ago, I would have been evangelical about planning. I would have spoken to you at length about, you know, the the cells in my Excel sheet. Um, So clearly, I just like to try doing things differently. And I wouldn't be surprised at all, actually, if book three evolves yet again. I think I've recognised, actually, that I thought process was so important in that you had to find the one that worked for you. And once you had it, once you'd lucked upon that holy grail process, you'd know how to write a brilliant book and that other authors had it. And if I could only read enough Q&As and enough interviews with other authors, I would work out what the right way to write a book was, which I sort of know saying that to you now is silly because everybody is unique and personal and you will always find your own way. But I think... I'd sort of been um, tricking myself into thinking I had to find the right way of doing things. Whereas now I recognise you just do whatever you need to do to get a book done. And every story is slightly different. And the, the quicker you can free yourself to try something new and follow your instincts, the happier and better the work will be. And actually, I learned um, writing book two that the plan, following the plan in the same format and structure that I had before, wasn't working. When I was putting words down on the page, they were cold and I was uninspired and I really wasn't enjoying it, but I held on for another few weeks because I told myself, no, no, this is the way you do it. This is how you put a book together. This is what works. And actually the second I freed myself from that, um, everything, everything flowed much more happily. So I think instinct is important and then just testing and trying and iterating new ways of doing it um, feels fun. Just one more on what you have learned moving onwards. Um, what have you learned about how you work best on an optimal day that you might be able to take with you going forward? When I had that period of time when I was writing full time, um, once the edits were finished and I started writing, drafting book two, I definitely had to learn how to make the whole day count, which was a challenge. I would, I would run out of steam actually in the afternoons and I 
that didn't last actually. I began to get better at sort of coming back after a walk at lunchtime and using the same tricks as before to dive straight into the afternoon's work and, and push through um, and get that energy up again. But that showed me that actually writing is stamina. And it probably shows me why I need to not sit in that chair because I need to look after everything. It is stamina and it is discipline and it is just making sure you're looking after yourself to get the energy right where you can to to just keep going because it's really, really tough to write a book. It's really hard to get through 90,000 words or 100,000 words and then redo them again and again and again. Um, and therefore, you just need to sort of have that um, core of steel to just to just keep going and believe that it's all, all going to come together. So I suppose the biggest stuff I learned was was perhaps less practical and and more mindset, um, which hopefully will carry me through. I mean, I say that. I also had massive mega wobbles along the way where uh, drama me would have happily thrown the whole laptop out the window. So, you know, uh, I think it's just about just trying to keep it all moving. At the time of recording, like today is your publication day, right? And I'm interested in, in like the landscape that it's like for an author now. Because 10, 20, 30 years ago, uh, press and marketing, the onus to sell a book, wasn't necessarily on on you. Uh, I guess pub- publishers would have set you up with more traditional uh, linear interviews in print or on telly or on radio. But now in the world of, you know, Twitter and Insta and now threads, there's like so much that you need to do. Podcasts like this, there's so many more books out there. Um, how are you feeling about, I know that, I know obviously you're very excited, but how are you feeling about uh, like the differences in landscape for what you now need to do to make your book stand out that perhaps wasn't there 20 years ago? How are you dealing with that pressure of making people buy it well it's a great question actually i mean first of all it is great and you feel lucky and grateful that you have the opportunity to uh, talk about a book that is coming out into the world so it's not lost on me that it's fabulous to be able to to do that and i suppose the truthful answer is that i have nothing to compare it to so you know from from my perspective i'm coming out with my debut novel and being a debut feels very lucky and you're very mindful i think that you can only be that once and i've also had the most phenomenal support from my publishers and it's also not lost on me that publishers with the best one in the world cannot give as much as they would love to the same level of resource and care to everybody and so i'm in a very lucky Um, and sort of golden position at the moment. So I think for me, actually, it's just about trying to make the most of that. Um, And I'm sure other authors would agree with this. You just want to do your best and put your best foot forward. Um, So I, you know, have tried to say yes to everything that comes my way um, and feel excited and grateful when it does. um, And have also tried to do my own bit to support all of that as well. So I think it's important to make sure, you know, if you can, you're setting up your website and starting your email subscriber list and trying to think about what you want to say on social media and make sure you are going out to talk to bookshops and get a sense of retail and do your research just as you would if you were building your career in any sector. And I did feel that when I got this deal, that this was me starting a new second author career along alongside my my first one and that on that basis I needed to build a bit of a network and try and talk to and, and, and meet people if I was at events and and say yes to um invitations if they came my way um despite you know sometimes feeling shy and nervous and slightly out of my comfort zone and you know truthfully even having conversations like this um, when we pressed record at the beginning, of course, there's a massive gulp. Where I'm like, what? I don't know what I'm doing. Who, imposter syndrome kicks in, Dad. It is real. Um, but I think, you know, for me, it's just trying to to see this as a really good opportunity, just as writing the book was, to just make the most of it. And, you know, the support that publishers can give, it can be fantastic. So be grateful for that, but don't t- take it for granted. And recognise too that, you know, things will change in the future. And what I've always heard about, this game is that it's a squiggly line and that 
success doesn't sort of follow in a uh, linear fashion. You need to be prepared to sort of recognize that book by book, things can be quite arbitrary um, and being pragmatic is probably key. So I try and just keep all of that in mind um, and take each opportunity as it comes and, and, and just try and make most of it. The Housekeepers is a historical heist and it's set in London in the summer of 1905 and tells the story of Mrs. King, who is a very charismatic, sharp-witted housekeeper to one of Mayfair's grandest mansions, who, on being unfairly dismissed from her post, decides to carry out the most audacious robbery that high society has ever seen in order to get her revenge. And the starting point of inspiration was twofold. So I'd been really longing to write a novel set in the 1900s for the glamour and opulence and corruption that exists on the underside of all that gloss. And I was also really itching to try and write a heist because from a plot structure perspective, I love that structure. And I was really, really longing to sort of test and see if I could do the engineering myself. And I'd also been reading a book called The Lost Mansions of Mayfair, which details some of the absolutely gorgeous houses that were once scattered all across West London. And I was thinking I would love to use one of those or a fictionalised version of one of those to set a really glamorous, rackety, high stakes heist. And I was washing the dishes, aptly enough, in the summer of 2020, when I started to sort of think through, could I do a sort of oceans meets downtown meets upstairs, downstairs as my next book? Um, and then in the weeks that followed, sort of letting that thread unspool um, was, was was just a really, really joyful and exciting planning and thinking process. So more on that planning process then, we've already said how for this novel, you had planned it quite thoroughly. You've been washing the dishes, you've kind of decided what you want to write, like very simply, what comes next? What questions are you thinking about to get your characters in order to figure out what the heist is going to be? What's going to be nicked? What's going to be given back and retrieved? So it was a case of sort of starting small and then broadening out. So candidly, I have written, you know, multiple books over the years that are sitting in drawers and, you know, were sent out to agents and were quite rightly rejected because they weren't ready. But with this idea, I just had that feeling of, oh, I'd really love to write this and I really can't get this wrong. So the first step was just trying to hone that sort of one line pitch and just really think through what the headline positioning for the story would be would be like. And then from that, try to slowly build out a cast of characters who could be part of a heist team. So to me, a heist always depends on its fantastic multidimensional gang of individuals who all bring their own specific skills to the game. So I started to just play, building out who could be in Mrs. King's team. The next thing I did was just think through what the key story beats would be at a sort of headline level. So I'm a big fan of Save the Cat, as I know many of your listeners and other guests are. So I looked at, to be very specific about it, um, Golden Fleece beats and Heist beats more generally, and mapped those onto a eventually very detailed spreadsheet and started to try and think about what some of the key scenes could be. At that point, the characterization and some of the movement between those key scenes was all really vague in my mind, really, really blurry. But I was just trying to think through what could some set pieces be? What could some settings be? And then at the same time, I just started researching what's going to be in that house. So to your question, if you're going to do a massive robbery, what are you robbing? So what are the carpets like? What paintings are on the walls? What's the quality of the furnishings? Um, who's in the house? What other servants are there? Who's the family upstairs? Where did their money come from? All of those research questions were really, really delicious, actually. And I adored that part of the process and could have kept going down that rabbit hole forever and ever. Um, and then as I sort of built that world and thought through who was in that house, I could then go through my plan again, start trying to knit together some of those turns, scene by scene, section by section. And that resulted then in my sort of detailed scene plan. So I got most of that done with some quite big holes in it, and then started just diving into the first draft. Talking about the scene plan, 
you've said it was quite thorough. How extensive was it? If I were to open up your your spreadsheet and click to see at random, like what what would I find there? It would be sort of, I suppose, like a written version of a uh, what I imagine a storyboard would look like. It 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 was very functional. Uh, present tense, almost like the writing you'd use in a synopsis, I would say. So if I look back on um, box one of scene one um, of The Housekeepers, I think it would have said something like, um, Mrs. King is in the kitchen, um, tabletop has been scrubbed, uh, she hears Mr. Butler, i.e. the butler doesn't yet have a name, coming into the room and she turns and says something along the lines of dot 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 and I would probably sketch what type of thing the character would say but I wouldn't care at all about the way in which I wrote it and I would then when writing the first draft sort of layer over all of that some atmosphere mood and then try and think through who that character actually is and get the dialogue right and I think sort of talking this through with you because I haven't actually analyzed it as closely I think it's in those moments that then the character sort of picks up from the page and will say or do things that feel right for them and for the story. And thus the scene plan sort of starts to evolve a little bit. And you then have to range forwards and tweak things further down your grid to make sure that the whole piece is going to kind of hold together. But that that's sort of what you would see. It's something very, very functional, first person, um, uh, present tense, uh, uh, and just sort of um, just there to just help me get the words down. Let's talk about language. Writing a heist, all kind of heist books and caper films are presented in a certain way. And I can't quite put my finger on like what it is. There is an atmosphere about them, a, a, a touch of fun. Quite a lot of them are tongue in, tongue in cheek. There is a, a way that they are written. How much did you think about that when you were actually putting the next word on the page about sentence structure, about what type of uh, words and language that you were using? For me, the first step was wanting this book to be fun to write. Whereas some of the books I've written in the past were quite dry, (laughs) maybe slightly gloomy. So the tone came quite naturally. Um, This was, and this was Partly why I said to you before, I, I did the first draft in, in Korea, just to give me that freedom to sort of feel a bit more cinematic and a bit more zippy and just keep things ticking along. So to me, I, I wanted the tone to feel um, fast and funny and dry, but also move into slightly more gothic sensation fiction at moments as well. So it was just about just giving myself the freedom to let the voice of the overarching book shift dependent on where we were. So if we were with a really audacious um, con artist, my favourite character, Hepzibar, who is my decoy duchess, her scenes are going to be fun. They're going to be light. They're going to be fast. There will be other moments in the book that require that slightly denser, darker, um, thicker prose. And I think that that's just something that you can only do by instinct, I think, and feel feel what you think the story requires and, and then shift accordingly. We've spoken about how like you really wanted to write this and you really wanted to make sure it was good. So the first sentence, Mrs. King laid out all the knives on the kitchen table. Th- this might be like very niche and th- there might not be an answer here at all. But how much did you think about that, about getting that first sentence right? I thought about that a lot, actually. So I take quite a long time to try and get the first sentence together. And I think, just picking my brains, looking back at the first draft, I think the first paragraph hasn't changed massively in every round of edit. And I don't think that 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 very first line has changed at all. I think the overall paragraph, I, I probably tightened it honed it, streamlined it in the course of editing. But that first line, I think, has always been there. And I like to start with a name and I like to start with a piece of action. That to me is... Why the name? Oh, well, Mrs. King's name came really organically. And actually, I can't... That I can't can't remember. I think... Why do you like to start with it? uh, Well, I start with a name because I think it just situates me as a reader with who am I looking at on the page and whose character 
is driving this first movement in the plot. And I always like to open a book and feel as though something's changed, something's happening to someone and we're off to the races straight away. So I think that's why for me, starting with 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 your protagonist's name just feels like a really good straightforward way in, in into the story you mentioned that you'd had books like we all do that are going to sit in the top drawer and we we'll never see the light of day and they weren't right why do you think this one was right what made you think that this is the one that if you took it seriously could get picked up and do stuff i think for me I mean, it's hard to tell, isn't it? And you don't want to be too grandiose about it because there's luck involved in all of these things. But I think for me, this book from the start felt more fun and felt more me and felt as though I was um, trying less to write well and trying more to just tell a good story. And I do think that made a difference. And also, I really, really thought about the pitch. I really tried to get the angling and positioning of this book right and, and hold that all the way through the drafting and editing processes. And actually, when I look back at my agent submission letter, um, some of the phrases in that letter have sort of travelled all the way down through the process onto the back flap of the book today, beautifully honed and polished and improved. But but some of the sort of core um, underpinnings of what, what, what I said the book was about have, have travelled through. And I think that helped. I think books I'd had in the past were less demarcated in terms of genre, I think I was less confident in telling a story. I could, for example, perhaps set the book up, but I would get lost in the famous baggy middle. Um, I um, <laughs> would sort of end things very abruptly. I think just that sort of understanding of story framework and care over, over structure has just sort of maybe come over time and practice. And I think I do think you just have to write books that just don't quite work. And you you learn so many lessons that you almost can't pinpoint. Um, and then you just start and do it again and just hope that each one is is slightly better than the one that came before. So yeah, hard, hard to know why it worked and the others didn't. But also I think it's sort of that, as you say, that inevitable piece that we all have those books in, in a drawer because that's, that's part of the apprenticeship. And lastly, we've spoken about a kind of pressure and how things have changed as you've moved through books. Uh, this novel, like as you said, won the Caledonia Novel Award last year. Uh, it's been optioned for TV. You know, the, the script is kind of rumbling on. I know this does happen with novels, but that's incredibly exciting for a debut. How are you going about not letting that excitement and that perhaps pressure infiltrate what's coming next, what you're writing tomorrow? Well, that's a really good question. I think the honest answer is I probably am letting all of that pressure infiltrate what's coming next. And I, and I think I try and use it as good pressure to make the most of the moment and try and just do what I can to um, just deliver a, a book to that, that, can, that can maintain any momentum that, that we're lucky enough to build. I mean, all of the things you've just mentioned, they're really thrilling. I mean, they are the dream, it's everything you could kind of hope for. Um, but, you know, I also recognise that that some of those very exciting and shiny things, it's a, a long and winding road and, you know, options and screen. There's there's lots and lots of pitfalls along the way and it's not lost on me that, that, that you have to just be super, super pragmatic about it all. So I think when all of that is said and done, to give you the really honest answer, actually, after after I got the deal I, and after our edits were finished, I definitely had a moment where I did feel like I'd gone a bit mad. It was all quite a lot. I did feel quite anxious. And I think I've heard from other authors that they, they felt the same. And I realised at that point that the thing I love to do is just write a scene, tell a story, play with character, do the research and just get back to the page and back to the book. And when that fails or I'm feeling stuck for inspiration, reading is the love I, is the thing I love most of all and that will always guide me home so I think um, no matter how shiny or conversely scary things may get as long as I can pick up a good book have a good read and then when I'm ready in the morning with my noise cancelling headphones on and my Pomodoro timer at the ready I'll be able to put some words down on the page and as long as I just keep focused on that little incremental bit by bit approach fingers crossed I'll be okay wish me luck 
That is it for this week's Writer's Routine with Alex Hay on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on, Alex. You can get a copy of that brand new book, The Housekeepers. It is out right now. Uh, We are back next week with another author on the show detailing how they work through their day. In the meantime, you can support us at patreon.com forward slash writer's routine. You can drop me an email. Uh, Use the contact page, actually. Writersroutine.com makes it much easier. And I am on uh, X Twitter. For a limited time, everything's always changing, and I'm probably not going to pay for that. So we'll see how we get on, though. Um, It's uh, at Writer's Pod over there, and I will see you next week with a brand new episode. Until then, bye. (laughs) 